Okay, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to be talking about galactic winds and galaxy evolution, but first I want to go over some of the methods that we are using because they're actually really exciting and uh, very revolutionary. So, um, basically, in the past few years, astronomy has been sort of undergoing a 3D re uh, revolution. This is due to a lot of new instruments and facilities that we've had come online, one of them being MUSE. Um, what MUSE does is basically take a two-dimensional field of view on the sky and then observe it at a range of wavelengths. In this range of wavelengths, um, we can um, see the three-dimensional structure um, in that field of view, as well as different chemical species. I'm only going to talk about the three-dimensional structure today, though. And so in the past, we had images like the one on the left from the Hubble Space Telescope in two dimensions, but now with MUSE, we can see this fully in 3D. Now, the way that we do this is we use a technique called the Doppler shift. For those of you who haven't heard of it, it's basically saying that emission coming towards you is going to be slightly blue shifted compared to if it were stationary, so slightly bluer than blue. And then emission going away from you is going to be red shifted. And the way that this works with this um, image cube from Muse that I have on the screen is um, each one of these panels corresponds to a slightly different wavelength. And so if we start up at the upper left-hand corner where you see a lot of emission up there, these are the blue shifted panels. And then as we progress through the movie, we end up on the red shifted side. So what this corresponds to in 3D is essentially a three-dimensional rotating cone with the left-hand side being the blue shifted part coming towards you and then the right-hand side being the red-shifted part going away from you. So 3D methods are exceptionally useful for studying galactic winds. This is because they are essentially three-dimensional cones. And the 3D methods give us a good sense of their geometries and how they're moving. So what are galactic winds? These are very powerful outflows from the centers of galaxies. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see a very well-known galactic wind in NGC 253, a nearby galaxy, and we concentrate at the very center of this galaxy, within the innermost two kiloparsecs. Now, that translates into about 1,600 times the distance between our sun and its nearest neighboring star. So these are really at the very centers. Um, the galactic winds are generally driven by starburst activity, as well as active galactic nuclei. So where do they fit in the big picture? Why do we care about galactic winds? Basically, galaxies evolve over time. If you look at the picture near the top of the slide, you'll see that the galaxies in the early universe look very different from the galaxies that we see today in the local universe, which are shown at the bottom of the slide. So galaxies evolve over time. And a lot of this depends on their star formation. Now, stars form from gas. So if we have galactic winds launching gas from these galaxies, they're going to be taking away some of the star formation um, because they're taking away that gas. So galactic winds suppress and quench star formation, and thus they affect the galaxy evolution. Now, I'm showing this orange image a lot. This is ionized gas, so this is very hot gas being ejected from the galaxy. But we can also observe different types of gas in galaxies. This blue gas is molecular gas. It's cold, dense gas observed with the ALMA telescope. And it's of the same object, so I've just superimposed them on each other. And the blue image is actually provided by Nico Krieger at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. Um, he's a collaborator of ours. And if you look at these two images, they look very different, but they're really the same object. It's just different types of gas. And you'll see that the cold, dense molecular gas is really concentrated near the base of the wind. So if you remember that cone that I showed in the earlier slide, this is really, um, this blue gas is really just coming up at the base and being entrained near the bottom. But when we actually look at these together, we get a better sense of the geometry as well as the total mass outflow rate, which is what we then um, compare to the star formation rate in these galaxies. 
So this work is actually thanks to a lot of people um, over decades of work, especially the Muse Consortium and the European Southern Observatory, also the ALMA Observatory, National Radio Astronomy Observatory in the US, and um, the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. So it's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And I want to bring your attention to another event that we're going to have that's very similar to this one in about four months called Linking the Milky Way and Nearby Galaxies. This is going to pl take place at the Think Corner and we're gonna have two hours of astronomy talks by international experts who happen to be visiting Helsinki during that week. So if you like this talk, you should definitely come to those because those are actually gonna be better. So um, thank you for your time and um, I'm sure if you have any questions, Lisa will allow some. So. I definitely will. Let's give a round of applause to Laura. <laughs> Thank you. That was fascinating and beautiful as well. Uh, can you give us a bit of a uh, short uh, brief about the astronomy field in Finland? Who are the kind of main research players here? Right, so um, astronomy is actually very active in Finland. Um, there is an organization called the Finnish Center for Astronomy, or FINCA, which is who I work for. Um, the University of Helsinki is part of FINCA, so uh, University of Oulu, uh, University of Turku, Aalto University, and Helsinki are all part of um, FINCA. So, yeah, it's pretty active. Sounds exciting. Um, uh, and you were actually telling us about this event really quickly. You are going to have an amazing astronomy super week in Helsinki pretty soon in the spring. Um, tell us a bit more about how that happened. Yeah, so um, like I said, we have this linking the Milky Way and nearby galaxies event. This is actually in connection to a conference that we're organizing um, of the same name. And so that's a 100-person conference. And then there's another conference that's going to be happening uh, with the Euclid Consortium. So there will be, in total, maybe four or 500 astronomers in Helsinki that week. So lots of talent to um, bring in, and so it should be some very good talks. Sounds very exciting. Um, let's get back to your research. Galactic winds, they launch gas. But can you sort of go through that again? What, how much do we actually know what happens to that gas? Uh, okay, so, um, so yeah, I, I kind of gave it a little bit of a simple picture, just saying, yeah, the gas goes out and it disappears. But it, it really doesn't in most cases, because in most cases, the gas doesn't actually reach the escape velocity um, to actually leave the galaxy. So in most cases, it's launched and then it comes back and rains down on the galaxies to fuel future star formation in other parts of the galactic disk. Um, uh, some of it does escape the galaxies and it uh, pollutes the intergalactic medium, but a majority of it just kind of stays in there. Okay. Yeah. Interesting tidbit of information. Um, I have to ask you something that we talked about earlier or that you sort of mentioned in passing. You said that, okay, uh, usually us, us, we astronomers are either Milky Way people or then we are, was it nearby galaxies people or outer galaxies people? Yeah, I guess, um, so Milky Way, nearby galaxies, nearby and galaxies. then the uh, even further out high redshift people, and, and we aren't even inviting them to the conference. <laughs> um, but no, the, the Milky Way and nearby galaxy communities have often been a little um, uh, isolated from each other, but now uh, we're trying to bring that, um, bring, bring them more together, and that's one of the goals of this conference. That's gonna be super exciting. Can you tell me a bit more about uh, the kind of international collaboration uh, that's happening in astronomy? You said that Helsinki might be able to play uh, an interesting role. Yeah, so, um, with, uh, with Finca, we've definitely been bridging Finnish astronomy with the rest of Europe. Um, it's definitely been more active. But also, um, we're trying to branch out to other um, parts of the world as well. And Helsinki is a really great location for this because, in part, um, there are a lot of uh, direct flights here. And so, uh, 
say, people from Asia can come and actually come to Helsinki first before they continue on to the rest of Europe. So we can kind of be a bridge to the international communities. Um, and so hopefully uh, we can really get even more great astronomy going in Finland. Sounds very exciting. Uh, one last question about 3D. Since uh, 3D technology has obviously been a huge game changer in so many different fields, from research to industry and all sorts of things, and uh, it's, you already told us that it changed astronomy as well, but how, uh, for how long has the shift been sort of going on? What's the time frame? Okay, so... Um yeah, that was something that I kind of blurred a little bit. So in radio astronomy we and uh, submillimeter astronomy, so longer wavelengths that our eyes can't see, we've had this 3D astronomy for many, many years over large fields of view. Um, uh, probably in the past 20, 15 years or so, um, it's becoming more popular in the optical um, to have these uh, larger fields of view and also be able to see the 3D wavelengths as well. But really, it's, it's gotten a huge boost with instruments like Muse in the past few years. Sounds amazing. I'd like to thank you, Laura, for a nice talk, and let's give her another round of applause for her.